Hi, my name is Baptiste Lebihan from the University of Geneva. This is a lecture on the metaphysics of quantum gravity from a philosophical side. I will present possible philosophical interpretations of space-time emergence by using materials from the philosophy of mind and metaphysics literature. These lectures aim at presenting the different metaphysical interpretations we may have of the idea that space-time emerges from a non-spatial temporal structure. In order to do so, I will compare space-time emergence from a non-spatial temporal structure with the supervenance of consciousness on physical systems. No background in physics or in philosophy is needed, although some acquaintance with one of the two literatures might help. Quantum gravity is the name of a constellation of research programs aimed at finding new framework to weave together all we know from general relativity and quantum field theory into a new framework. Quantum field theory does a very good job at describing the universe with its quantum effects, but it does not describe gravitation. On the other hand, general relativity offers an excellent characterization of gravitation, describing it as a geometrical aspect of space-time. But it does not take into account quantum effects. And we need a theory of quantum gravity to describe the phenomena which include both relativistic and quantum effects, like black holes or the earlier stages of the universe. In order to do that, various research programs have been developed into many directions. An interesting point is that many of these approaches, like loop quantum gravity and string theory, deny the fundamental reality of space-time and claim that space-time is somehow emergent from something else. One day, hopefully, physics will tell us what the fundamental level of reality looks like um, and what this something else is. Perhaps the fundamental world is made of one-dimensional strings living in an 11-dimensional structure, as described by string theory, interwoven spin networks, as proposed by loop quantum gravity, or something even stranger, which is not spatial at all. In this video, we will not discuss the details of each account, and rather focus on the abstract picture we get from space-time emergence. Whatever the fundamental structure will turn out to be, we will have to explain the empirical success of the physical theories we actually take to be our more fundamental theories about the world, general relativity and quantum field theory. In order to do this, we will have to relate the new theory of quantum gravity to general relativity and quantum field theory in order to see how we may derivate the older theories as approximations of the new theory. And we will have to answer the problem of empirical coherence namely to explain how it is possible that our measurements and observations are not taking place in a fundamental space-time and nonetheless justify our theories. These issues of relating all theories with the world through a new theory are nothing like what we saw before in the history of science because of the explanatory gap between the spatial and the non-spatial. How are we going to relate these new theories to our familiar old theories which primitively posit space and time, and were historically empirically constructed by making observations in time and space? How can we derivate space and time from entities which are not spatial nor temporal? What does it mean that space and time emerge from something else? Note that the expression emergence has a different meaning in philosophy of physics and the rest of the philosophical literature. In philosophy of physics, the term is neutral and doesn't convey any particular theory about the exact nature of this relation, or at least there is no unique interpretation of the term. By contrast, in the rest of the philosophical literature, and in particular in the philosophy of mind, the notion carries the idea of ontological novelty, not reducible to the emerged structure, popping into existence at the emergent level. In what follows, I'll subscribe to the tradition in philosophy of physics and use the notion of emergence as a neutral term, waiting for further analysis. If we step back from the problem of space and emergence and look at the status of space and time across history, we find something very interesting with a long story of revisions of our ordinary notions of space and time. With special relativity, we found evidence that space and time should be seen as features of some other structure, Minkowski space-time. 
Then with general relativity, we discovered that space-time is not really an independent structure in which things happen. There is an interdependence between space-time geometry and matter distribution. Quantum gravity takes the story one step further, and the revisions of our ordinary notions of time and space reach a whole new level. The structure of relativistic space-time may well be an illusion or an approximation of a new structure which is very different from relativistic space-time, so different that it's not space-time anymore. But perhaps one will object that this structure is still spatiotemporal, and that it's just that it is spatiotemporal in a different way. Fair enough. But in the case of space-time emergence, it seems that we end up with a fundamental structure so different from our ordinary notions of space and time that most of its attributes are lost in the revision, and that it makes far more sense to think of the fundamental structure as being non-spatial temporal. For instance, if relations of proximity in the fundamental structure do not correspond to the relations of proximity we observe in the emergent space-time, in which sense should we continue to refer to the fundamental structure as being space? As indicated in the title, I propose to examine this issue with an analogy between space-time emergence and philosophy of mind. In philosophy of mind, we may distinguish between two issues, the easy problem of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. The easy problem consists in finding the necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of mental states, coached in scientific terms. Or to put it differently, the project aims at finding correlations between mental states and physical phenomena by using our best scientific models in physics, neurobiology and cognitive sciences. The aim is to determine what the biological properties which trigger mental states are. For instance, is there a biological state or do we have here distinct kinds of substances or properties related by relation of some kind? Or does it mean that the mental is a pure illusion? that it's not real? With consciousness, because of the qualitative aspect of our experience, the what it's like to experience, and its subjective aspect, the fact that these experiences seem to point in the direction of a subject having these experiences, we develop a rich terminology quite hard to translate into the vocabulary of physics. It seems that we have a mystery to deal with, namely the gap between two terminological worlds that seem to be very different, the physical and the mental. This problem is said to be hard because it does not seem that science could help us to solve it. It appears to be quite abstract, perhaps rooted in the concepts we use to describe the world. But it does not mean that the problem is not genuine. Or at least, if the problem is not genuine, it has to be shown exactly why and an explanation of the existence of different terminologies has to be gestured. Compare this with the situation we have to deal with in quantum gravity. If the theory of quantum gravity turns out to be one of the many views which claim that space-time is not fundamentally real, how are we going to conceive of the connection between the spatial-temporal and the non-spatial-temporal? Here again, I believe it's enlightening to distinguish between two problems, the easy problem of space-time and the hard problem of space-time. The easy problem aims at finding the necessary and sufficient non-spatial temporal conditions for the existence of a spatial temporal physical system. Or, to put it differently, the challenge is to derive the spatial temporal theories we actually take to be fundamental, general relativity and quantum field theory, from a theory of quantum gravity. This derivation will have to take a precise logical form, using mathematical tools and bridge principles to connect the primitive notions of the derivative theories to the primitive notions of the fundamental theory. This problem is not easy at all. In fact, it's a central part of the challenge of quantum gravity. How to recover relativistic space-time and quantum field theory, at least as distant approximations, from a theory of quantum gravity. But just as with the philosophy of mind, the problem is easy in the sense that we have good reasons to believe that physicists will be able to do the work and produce such a derivation 
in the future. So the problem is, is easy only in the sense that it might be solved by physicists, but of course the resolution itself will be extremely difficult. In contrast, what I will call the hard problem of space-time addresses the, the explanatory gap between a spatial temporal theory and a non-spatial temporal theory. How are we going to fill the gap between a spatial temporal ontology and a non-spatial temporal ontology? The spatial temporal vocabulary, or say the conjunction of the spatial and the temporal vocabulary, is deeply rooted in conceptual apparatus, and it's far from clear that we should deal with space, time and space-time if these are not fundamentally real. What matters here is that even if we manage to solve the easy problem in offering a derivation of general relativity and quantum field theory from the novel theory, a gap will still have to be filled. Why is it the case that the spatial temporal theory works as an approximation of a non-spatial temporal theory? The hard problem of space-time has been approached by philosophers of physics in terms of the notion of physical salience. The term was coined by Tim Modlin in the context of realism about configuration space, a particular way of, of thinking about quantum mechanics. According to this interpretation, the world is not an ordinary space evolving in time, but a configuration space, or more rigorously, a physical counterpart of the configuration space, which is a mathematical entity, featuring all the parameters of the system evolving in time. As in quantum gravity, philosophers have been discussing the relation obtaining between the exotic space posited and our familiar space. We will not discuss this particular interpretation of quantum mechanics here, but it's useful to know that the philosopher wanting to address the problem of space-time emergence in quantum gravity may find many useful tools in this literature. At first glance, the notion of physical science may be analyzed in opposition to mere mathematical derivability. Is it enough to show that we can derivate mathematically a spatial temporal theory from a non-spatial temporal theory to show that the derivative theory describes adequately the world? Arguably not. We can build many descriptions by using a mathematical framework and we still want to secure the further condition that the derivative theory entertains a spatial relationship with the world and describe it adequately. As Mudlin puts it, an ontologically complete description of a physical situation should provide, in a relatively transparent way, an exact representation of all the physical entities and states that exist. It should say just what there is and no more. End of quotation. I believe that we may shed new light on the notion of physical science in using the distinction between the easy and the hard problem of consciousness. Physical science corresponds not only to derivability, just like the hard problem of consciousness asks not only for the correlation between the mental and the physical, it asks about the more intimate relationship between the spatial and temporal and the non-spatial temporal. In the same way, the hard problem of consciousness asks about the intimate relation between consciousness and the physical. I suggest that we look at the main strategies to deal with this explanatory gap in the philosophy of mind in order to understand by analogy what our main options are to approach the hard problem of space-time. These strategies are dualism, reductive physicalism, eliminativism, and non-reductive physicalism. Dualism considers that the explanatory gap is good evidence for the existence of two different kinds of entities physical entities, and mental states. By analogy, a dualist about space-time emergence should consider that the explanatory gap between the physical and the mental provides good support to the belief that spatial and non-spatial temporal entities are numerically distinct entities, related by a relation of some kind. Let's call this view the derivative space-time view. According to eliminativism, there are no mental entities. All the talk in terms of mental entities is strictly speaking false, and consciousness is illusory. By analogy, 
the explanatory gap between the spatiotemporal and the non-spatiotemporal comes from the fact that spatiotemporal theories are strictly speaking false and there are no spatiotemporal entities in the world. Let's refer to this view as a no spacetime view. According to reductive physicalism, mental states are identical with some physical states. Of course, it's then very hard to make sense of the vivid impression we have that mental states are special, with specific features that make them very unlike physical entities. Physical entities are public entities accessible by everyone, when mental states are merely accessible to its owner and enjoy a distinct flavor, seeing for instance of, the what it's, of the what it is like to see a red object. By analogy, again, a reductionist about space-time emergence would have to argue that spatial temporal entities are identical with some non-spatial temporal entities. Here again, we have to find a deflationist account of the explanatory gap in explaining why we believe that there is a spatial flavor of spatial temporal entities. Let's call this view space-time reductionism. Non-reductionist physicalism or functionalism is the view that mental states are realized by physical states but are not non-ambiguously identical with these physical states. The idea is that mental states are individuated by the place in a network of mental states playing causal roles in the overall structure. Each mental state is physical in the sense that it's identical with a physical state and so it's why it's called a physicalist view. However, the view is non-reductionist because the mental state depends for its existence on other mental states constituting the network of mental states. By analogy, non-reductionist about space-time emergence will have to argue that spatial temporal entities are causal roles realized by non-spatial temporal entities. However, although functionalism is very popular among philosophers of mind, I believe that the view is deeply flawed in being unstable when we look at the ontological status of causal worlds. Either these are real entities and the view collapses into dualism, or these are merely approximations without an exact physical counterpart and the view collapses into eliminativism. So in what follows, I will present only three general options to approach the hard problem of space-time by analogy with the philosophy of mind. The no space-time view, the analog of eliminativism, the derivative space-time view, the analog of dualism, and finally, space-time reductionism, the analog of reductionist physicalism. According to the no space-time view, space-time is not fundamentally real because it does not exist to cool. This is probably the more straightforward way to reject the idea that space-time emergence entails the existence of levels of reality. Emergence will be a misnomer, or at best, it will be emergence in a, in a narrow epistemic sense, due to some limitations in our conceptual and perceptual apparatus, space seems to emerge. But really, mind independently, there is no genuine emergence of space-time, since there is no space. In this interpretation, the phenomenology of space and time relates directly to the fundamental non-spatial ontology without positing an in-between physical derivative spatial structure. Unlike the derivative space view, the no-space view does not require postulating a stratified ontology with distinct levels of reality. And it does not require positing a spatial relation connecting the entities inhabiting the distinct levels. So the no-space-time view is less demanding than the derivative space view and avoids any commitment to levels of reality. In the metaphysical and phenomenological literature, it's quite common to defend that time does not flow and that the notion of flow corresponds to a perceptual artifact. However, what is always presupposed in the background, in the background ontology are temporal relations. No space theorists have to deny that the very basic features common to time and space, like metrical and topological aspects, are real. So the challenge raised for the no space view is really radical. 
The difficulties here are very similar to the issues encountered by the eliminativists in philosophy of mind, in the same way that it seems almost crazy to defend that mental states and minds are not real. It seems likewise hard to claim that spatial temporal entities and space-time do not, do not exist at all. It's not to say that there is no room for the no-space-time view, though. Some work has still to be done in order to examine whether spatial temporality may be interpreted as a form of illusion, and a way to do that will be to examine the literature on eliminativism in the philosophy of mind and in metaphysics in general. According to dualism in the philosophy of mind, the explanatory gap is grounded in an ontological gap. There are really two kinds of entities in the world, mental and physical entities. They have different flavors because they are different, and that's it. Dualism applied to space-time amounts to the view that behind the explanatory gap, we find two collections of entities, spatial temporal entities and non-spatial temporal entities. Now these entities are related by system systematic relations to explain the relations. For instance, going back to philosophy of mind, according to Chalmers, there do exist psychophysical laws relating the mental and the physical. If we follow the analogy here, there do exist spatial temporal, not spatial temporal laws relating the two realms. But we don't necessarily need the concept of law to relate the two realms. What we do need is an ontological something which relates the two structures and explains the possibility to derive quantum field theory and general relativity from a theory of quantum gravity. To put it differently, if we want to go for dualism in order to explain the derivations, we need to posit an ontological something which does the work which explains why the derivation works. According to the derivative space-time view, space-time is not fundamentally real because it's only derivatively real. Space is grounded in, or it's built from, a more fundamental ontology. There are many possible ways to think of the connecting device obtaining between the two layers and grounding or building the higher level entities. One may construe the relation as a grounding relation or a causal relation, for instance. Not, however, that this relation has to be ontological. It cannot be um, a merely uh, a mathematical procedure. Perhaps it would be tempting to turn to grounding, a notion enjoying a lot of success in philosophy discussions nowadays. But I don't believe that they will be useful because it's not clear at all whether or not grounded entities are ontological free lunches. As it was developed at first, the notion of grounding was aimed at this kind of cheap ontologies. I don't know what's the best interpretation of this, but since there is no clear answer about whether grounded entities are ontological free lunches or not, I think the grounding notion um, I think that the grounding notion is not very helpful in making progress with the hard problem of space-time. The derivative view suggests not only that first the derivative world is stratified, and not only that second the layers are related by a connecting relation, but also third that the derivative structure is less fundamental than the fundamental structure. Does it mean that it occupies a distinct layer of reality? The general picture of science is stratified in physics, chemistry, biology, and more complex sciences with more fundamental than relations obtaining between them. It's a general philosophical issue to understand what the more fundamental than here amounts to. Does it mean that reality itself is layered into different levels of reality, with distinct entities obeying to different rules? Or is reality flat and there are only levels of description and no levels of reality? It seems that this debate takes a new inflection with the possible disappearance of space-time, since all other sciences are describing entities located in space and time. Should we think of general relativity and quantum field theory as special sciences, just like chemistry and biology? If yes, does it mean that the status of general relativity and quantum field theory is tied to the fate of the other special sciences? 
And if not, what are the consequences of space-time emergence for the debate between reductionists and anti-reductionists in science? Take note that there is no necessary connection between the stratified view and the existence of fundamentality relations. We may well discover one day that the world is stratified, although no relation of fundamentality is connecting the layers. Also, there is no logical connection between the, the existence of fundamentality relations and the view that this or that particular level is more fundamental than the others. Physics seems to construe the small-scale world as being more fundamental than the macroscopic and the cosmological scales. Still, it might be that the more fundamental level is a macroscopic level, or the cosmological level. By positing a derivative spacetime, a physical creator both distinct from the fundamental structure and the fundamental and sorry and the phenomenal space and time, we lay the ground for an answer to the question of why we experience space and time. If we perceive space and time, this is simply because space and time are real, although derivatively real. We have a direct phenomenal access to these derivative entities, and this is why our daily life takes place in a spatial and temporal environment. Also, the derivative view explains the empirical success of uh, general relativity. A derivative structure close enough to GR, space-time, is a physically real derivative entity. Finally, the derivative space view delivers, apparently, a solution to the problem of empirical coherence. This ontology does not come for free, of course, and maybe this is how far we should go to make sense of the physics. But perhaps not. There is a third option. In the philosophy of mind, reductionism is also called the identity theory and claims that mental entities are identical with physical entities. The reductionist then needs sophisticated stories to explain why we falsely believe that mental entities do possess specific marks that make them hard to be identified with physical entities. Perhaps when we feel that our pain is nothing physical, we do make a category mistake. Pain is simply identical to brain states, and believing the contrary is simply an illusion. Perhaps distinctive consciousness itself is an illusion, the strongest possible illusion. Could we apply a similar line of thought uh, in the case of uh, reductionism uh, about space-time? Could it be that space-time is a way to look at a non-spatial temporal structure? According to the reductionist view, the spatial temporal and the non-spatial temporal are both real, but, no numerically di- but not numerically distinct, as supposed by the um, derivative view. Reducing the spatial temporal to the non-spatial temporal means that the spatial temporal is literally the non-spatial temporal, viewed from a certain perspective, just like the mental, according to the identity theory, is a piece of physical furniture equipped with some specific properties. Of course, it's quite difficult to defend that a spatial temporal entity is identical with a non-spatial temporal entity, far more than far more so than identifying the mental with the physical, since the notion of mind does not convey the idea that the mind is not physical. In the case of the philosophy of mind, a mental entity is identical with a physical state, but does not appear so, because it's part of a mind. With the relationship between the spatial temporal and the non-spatial temporal, the situation is even more difficult. It seems that the reductionist view will lead us nowhere, But there might be interesting roads to explore in the reductionist spirit, for instance by examining whether spatial temporal relations might be made of non-spatial temporal building blocks, thereby using the notion of part to carry the reduction. With the notion of composition, we can put forward the view that that the spatial temporal is made of non-spatial temporal building blocks. This is still a reductionist view since spatial temporal entities are identified with sums of non-spatial temporal entities, and it's not incoherent to claim that the spatial temporal is identical to the non-spatial temporal, since the identity is not one to one, but one to many, relating one spatial temporal entity to multiple non-spatial temporal entities. 
I have myself argued that we can use the notion of logical composition as uh, used by uh, Laurie Paul to construct composition all the way up from the fundamental non-spatial temporal ingredients. One feature of this relation is that it's transcategorical, that it is transcategorical, sorry. The sum can belong to an ontological category distinct from the categories of its parts. This notion is primitive in the philosophical explanation, meaning that in order to understand what it is, we have to look at what it does. Here the idea is that this relation does a work of relating entities belonging to different um, levels of descriptions without positing that these entities belong to um, uh, different ontological levels. Or to put it differently, there is no metaphysical priority of one level over other levels. The fundamental level is merely more fundamental in the merological sense that it describes proper paths of entities described at a less fundamental level. But all these entities have the same ontological dignity. To be clear, in order to defend such a reductionist view, we still have to endure the claim that the whole is nothing more than its parts, and that a spatial temporal relation is nothing more than the non spatial temporal building blocks which compose it. To conclude this video, let me emphasize two points. First, a methodological point. Thinking of the problem of space-time emergence in abstract terms puts us in a situation very similar to the one wherein we are when considering the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of, co of space-time is a novel issue, similar in its form to the hard problem of consciousness. From this similarity, we may expect to find useful tools in the philosophy of mind to reach a better understanding of space-time emergence. Although it seems that the hard problem will not necessarily contribute to solving the easy problem, we may still expect it to clarify the ontological categories used to build up solutions to the easy problem. In brief, the hard problem in both cases is primarily a philosophical problem, while the easy problem might probably be solved by scientists. Second, as I hope to have shown, we should perhaps not interpret too seriously the idea of levels and refuse to commit to the view that with physics, we have a new reason to believe that space-time emergence supports the view that reality is stratified. I believe that the reductionist view of space-time is a promising program. The reductionist view, and in particular the merological view that I have mentioned, allows us to understand the reality of space-time without committing to the view that this space-time is some sort of non-fundamental entity in a strong sense. And it respects the idea that the description of the whole structure will be written down in non-spatial temporal terms. But a lot of work has still to be done in order to evaluate each approach to space-time emergence, and perhaps the dualist and emulativist approaches are other promising avenues to sort out the hard problem of space-time.